What's it like to be allowed inside an exclusive club you've only ever heard about? Why does it feel so terrible to be left out? And what do we have to do to be included in the things we care most about? I've struggled with feeling like I was left out and had to earn my way into life. But now I know there's a way to think about ourselves and our faith that can heal those wounds. Have you heard of Club 33? Club 33 is a private club within Disneyland. It opened in Disneyland in 1967 and was designed by Walt Disney himself to be like the exclusive and luxurious lounges that he experienced at the World's Fair. I got to go one time about 10 years ago to Club 33. Here's a picture of me outside. I have no pictures inside. It's too secret. It's too special. I got to go because an anonymous crossing attendee who is also a member of Club 33 made it possible for the entire staff of the crossing to have dinner there. Thank you, whoever you are. The current staff is very jealous. Can we please go again? It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for me in this exclusive club. You know, today the waitlist is supposed to be about five to ten years to become a member, and it can move faster if you're a VIP or you're nominated by another member. And if you are so lucky to be chosen off the waitlist, the initiation fees are supposedly $30,000, and then it is $15,000 a year to be a member. The door is located right next to the exit for Pirates of the Caribbean. It hides in plain sight with its infamous door and Mosaic 33. If you get to go in, it's kind of like an old hotel in Europe. Plus, there's special Disney memorabilia and history, and there is a strict code of conduct while you are inside, of course. One of my favorite things was the balcony where we could go out and look down on all the regular, common, unspecial people below. Exclusivity feels weirdly good sometimes, right? It's like. You feel like saying, hello, yes, I'm up here. I'm, I'm so special, more special. It's so weird. I read also that Club 33 members are offered special previews of new rides and that during the Haunted Mansion's 50th anniversary, there was an incredible costume party inside the mansion where Club 33 members danced in the ballroom where the ghosts dance. That's so cool. There are many exclusive clubs in the world, but for those of us who live in Southern California, Club 33 is the one we are so close to, but most of us are never allowed in. And it's a terrible feeling not being included, not being allowed in, because we were never meant to exclude each other the way we do. But even Christianity was exclusive in the beginning. Back in the beginning of Christianity, it was actually a really exclusive club. There was a man named Cornelius who really wanted to be let in, but he couldn't get off the wait list, basically. He couldn't pay the fees. He's like us wanting to get into Club 33, but unless someone invited him, made his reservation for him, and he had to follow all the strict codes of conduct, he would never get a chance. See, for the first seven or so years of the early church, in order to be considered a Christian, you also had to already be or needed to officially become Jewish, too, which meant you had to convert, follow their rules and laws and diets, offer sacrifices, and um, get circumcised, which is a pretty extreme initiation fee. See, in the first years after Jesus' resurrection, all the action was within the Jewish people. They were God's chosen people. Jesus had been Jewish. Pentecost happened only to Jewish people, which was this moment where the Holy Spirit, meaning the Spirit of God, was released on earth after the resurrection and given to each person to help them follow Jesus and understand God. Well, the early Christians were pretty much all Jewish, especially the leaders, and it just was so ingrained in their minds that Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people from other nations, they were not included in what God was doing that the Jewish people were God's chosen people, blessed by God to bless the world, but separate from the rest of the world. So if a Gentile like Cornelius felt drawn to worship Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Judaism, that Gentile would have to go through a ritual conversion before he could be counted as included, saved, part of the family. In early Christianity, Peter, one of the disciples and the leader of the early church and the other disciples, they were not trying to share the gospel with Gentiles. They were not eating with them. They weren't going to their houses. They're not talking about Jesus. They would not, could not without breaking the law. They respected and appreciated the Gentiles who believed in their God, but 
They could not share their lives and homes and food with them. You were either in or out. It was an exclusive club. But one fateful day, all of that changed. And Christianity as we know it was born, a way of being that is open to everyone, everywhere. That Jesus meant it when he said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is for the whole world. Today, we're going to talk about two chapters of the book of Acts, where our author Luke tells us this story of God showing his people that they need to open the doors to everyone. This story is pivotal to faith in Jesus, and Luke makes sure we understand what a big deal it is by repeating himself thoroughly. We repeat ourselves for emphasis, right? I mean, we repeat ourselves when it's important. Especially at a time when paper was expensive and writing was hard, whenever the authors of the Bible repeat something in detail, that is a big blinking light to us. This is important. And so as we read the letter Luke wrote that we now know as Acts 10 and 11, we will see that it is full of repetition. The repetition says that not only was this important in the lives of the people we are learning about, it is important in our lives too. In Acts 10, we meet a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Now, he lives in a beautiful seaside port town named Caesarea. Back then, Romans, they didn't believe in one god. They believed in many gods like Jupiter, Augustus, Mars, Venus. But this man, Cornelius, he wasn't fulfilled by the regular ways of life as a Roman. Sure, he was successful. He was a centurion. That meant he's a leader of 100 of the best soldiers in the world. He's in a really pivotal port town, meaning he was trusted to handle important situations. And he's raised in the ways of Roman society. And yet, that way of living wasn't fulfilling for Cornelius. Somehow, he had sought after and gotten to know this one true God. Isn't it funny how we each come to be curious about God? Like, even when we're not raised that way. There's a man at our church I was just talking to, and he was talking about how his life before coming here was fine. It was just fine. But he kept driving by the crossing, and he'd get this feeling like he should just try coming one time to see what it's like. Changed his life to start really thinking about God. He loves knowing God. And that's what it was like for Cornelius. He loves God. Now, Cornelius had not converted to Judaism, but he loved God, and he lived as someone who understands the fundamentals of a godly life. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. And then one afternoon, Cornelius has a vision while he's praying. In Acts 10, verse 3, it says, One day, at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Notice, God knows his name. Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, What is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Cornelius immediately obeys. He's excited. He wants more of God in his life. He tells a few trusted people about his vision and sends them on the overnight 32-mile journey along the coast to Joppa to ask Peter to come with them. Now, meanwhile, we now cut to Peter, leader of the early Jesus followers, oblivious to what God is up to at this moment and the people about to show up where he is. It's now noon the next day. What we know about Peter is he's very hungry right now, and the food is still being prepared for lunch. It smells great, um, so that's actually making him impatient. And so he decides, I'm in a beautiful place. Why not go up to the roof to pray? So Peter's hungry, he's praying, and he has a vision. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. At first glance, it seems like he's so hungry that Peter is dreaming about a buffet coming down from the sky. But listen to his reply. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Why does he say surely not, Lord? I mean, imagine 
you are so hungry and you're praying and you have a vision of so much good food, a huge buffet, and then you realize that all that good food is touching maggots. That's what this was like for Peter. Peter is a good first century Jewish man. He follows the food guidelines in order to honor God and stay true to his Jewish family. And those guidelines, they weren't just about not eating certain things like pork, but your food could not even touch unclean animals or it would all be considered unclean. So if all the animals, reptiles, and birds are in a sheet that's being held up by its four corners, well, what happens? It all slides to the middle, right? It's all touching in the middle. Good food has touched unclean food, and so it's all there. And so to Peter, it's unclean. And Peter says, God, no, I can't eat that. Peter loved to argue with God. Peter gets focused on a fixed version of God and gets stuck there, as many of us often do. It's like he holds up a picture he drew of God up next to the real, active, living God, and he says, God, you look wrong. He gets so stuck that he argues with God about God. Now, we talked about Peter a couple weeks ago. This is about seven-ish years since the night that Jesus was killed, and Peter's picture of Jesus had to completely change then as well. And now, seven years later, he still gets focused on fixed versions of God and has to humble himself and surrender again before he can see that fuller vision. The voice responds to him and says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This gets repeated three times. Now, we know repeating means it's important, but if something happens three times, it demands our attention. That is a special number in the Bible. It's important for Peter and for us. It gets repeated three times, and then the sheet and the vision of the animals disappears. And it says, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter is wondering what it all means, the men Cornelius sent have found the house, and they are calling out. They feel an urgency. They are responding to God's request. Peter, on the other hand, Peter is still thinking. Even verse 19, it says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter is still sitting there thinking about what God said in the vision. Earlier, it says a voice spoke to Peter, but now it's clear to say the Spirit commands. Now, Simon, it's so literal. Get up, go downstairs, don't hesitate, Go with them, I sent them. Have you ever had to do that with a friend who's not really listening or with your kids? You're like, now, socks, shoes, stand up, walk to car. Literal commands, no confusion. God is not giving Peter something interesting to think about. He's giving Peter something important to do. And God is also very funny because he does not tell Peter that the men downstairs are Gentiles. He lets that be a surprise. All Peter knows is God has told him that he sent the people downstairs. The idea that God would send Gentiles to talk directly to Gentiles is so foreign to Peter. God's expanding Peter's vision, his heart, his mind. He goes downstairs and is faced with a surprise and choice. Go with all the traditions and customs he's always known and go against God's most recent word or listen and go with his most recent word. It says, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. This is a major turning point. Whoever you think is least likely to follow Jesus, whoever would never be invited into your home, Peter just let them in. Just inviting them in is a major change. On a normal day, a nice Jewish man would let the visitors know that there is an inn down the street for them to stay in. But Peter is already learning to see the weird and wonderful movement of God. He is obeying what the Spirit said. One amazing Bible treat in this story. Peter is in the town of Joppa. 
there's another Bible character who goes to Joppa. His name is Jonah. Now, stick with me. I just love these little nuggets that are left in the Bible. Jonah was a man God asked to deliver a message to a group of outsiders. God asked Jonah to bring a message of repentance and acceptance to the violent group of Gentiles called the Ninevites. Jonah was in Joppa, and it was there that Jonah decided to board a boat and go in the opposite direction from where God asked him to go. See, God's heart has always been about reaching people on the outside, in Jonah's day, in Peter's, and in ours. Peter is in Joppa when God tells him to go to the home of a man from the group of violent oppressors who are outside of his family. And Peter makes a different choice from Jonah. In the morning, he brings a few friends and he follows the outsiders, the Romans, the last ones he should follow, to, to Cornelius' home. It took a full day of walking, a full day of thinking about how he was breaking so many rules in order to follow God's new words. Peter arrives at Cornelius' home. He does not stay outside. He does not have Cornelius meet him in the courtyard. It says, Peter entered the house. This story is as much about Peter getting to know God as it is about Cornelius. Peter crosses that threshold of this Gentile's home, and there's no going back. Cornelius, a military man, a Roman commander, but one who loves God, he literally falls at Peter's feet in gratitude and reverence. And Peter says, stand up. I am only a man myself. Can you feel this shifting that's happening in Peter? He's realizing we're not that different, you and me. He follows Cornelius in, and the house is full. This is no secret gathering. This is a church service. He's now leading a church service for a group of people he shouldn't be this close to. He's so uncomfortable that he can't help but awkwardly point out the obvious. He says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. But may I ask why you sent for me? Don't you love the way Peter tells it? I mean, it's true. He made no objection to the men who asked him to come, but he sure made an objection to God. And maybe that's how it should be, right? We can make all the objections we want to God, but in the end, listen, obey, and don't fight with the people God sends your way. Cornelius tells his story about his vision, why he sent for Peter. Not only does Luke write it down when it first happens to Cornelius, but he writes it all out again here. And Cornelius ends with one of my favorite faith-filled, confident quotes. So, I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Oh, may we all have that response. So I acted immediately, and it was so good of you to participate. Now we're all here, because I invited all these people to participate, to hear what the Lord has commanded you to say. They were prepared. Peter was prepared by the Spirit. Everyone was ready for an experience with God. I pray we all come here as ready as they are. What Peter says next is the start of the international worldwide church as we know it today, the one we are called to continue, the one we are sent out to make, and it starts with this. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He's saying I now understand a deep truth about God. God does not show favoritism. The role of God's chosen people was to let every other person in the world know that God is real and that there's a new way to live. Not to have special people and not special people, not to have insiders and outsiders, but to have messengers who spread the good news to everyone, everyone. Andrew talked about it a few weeks ago and it's always been God's heart, but here is when it all really became real. The heart of the Christian faith and why it is the heart of the crossing is that we belong first. First we belong, then we learn to believe, and then we behave. The entire world has always been behave, then believe, then belong. But with Jesus, it's belong, then believe, then behave. The reason Luke writes out this story in Acts is to show us that the story of God's love is for everyone. 
You will never look into the eyes of someone God doesn't adore. No one is too outside. No one is too far gone. No one. Everyone belongs. And here's what Peter does. He tells them the story of Jesus. I want you to take this all in because this is how the world changed. Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And in the middle of him talking, without anyone coming to the front to accept Jesus into their hearts, without Peter leading them in a prayer of repentance and holding up their hands, their hearts were just so ready, so open, so hungry for the truth about God's love through history that just like that, the Holy Spirit came on them. The way the Holy Spirit came on the Jewish disciples years before in Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes to these Gentiles. There's nothing they do to make it happen. And the other Jewish men who came with Peter are astonished, honestly. These people, they haven't converted to Judaism. They, they've done none of the rituals or followed any of the rules. And yet, the Holy Spirit has come to them just like it did to the Jewish disciples. The Holy Spirit can come to you anytime. While we sing, while I'm speaking, while you're praying, anytime. If the thought, Jesus is Lord, comes into your head as a belief, that is an experience with God. I'll never get over that one simple verse that says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. To say and believe Jesus is Lord, that is an experience of God, an interaction with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that is always here now and always available to all of us. And this moment when the early Christians, when Peter saw it, it started. Peter says, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. This is when the vision for the church expands. Exclusivity is no more. Everyone can receive the Spirit of God into their lives as a helper for their journey. I have two questions for yourself. Have you invited Jesus into your life? And then as you think about others, who have you avoided talking to about Jesus? Just taking time to answer those two questions can change your life. Now in Acts 11, Peter returns to Jerusalem and everyone has heard what he did. He went to the Roman Gentiles. He had them in his home. He went to their home. He ate with them. Those are only things you do with family and you can't be family if you haven't followed the rules. I'm sorry to say this word again, but it says, the circumcised believers criticized him. Don't they always, I mean, when you go to the trouble of following the most difficult rules, don't you get mad when other people don't? Have you ever stood in a really long line and watched other people cut in at the door? Makes me so furious, I can hardly handle it. That's what's happening. These people stood in a long line, they followed all the rules, and now God is just letting everyone in. And Peter carefully and completely Luke writes it all down again. Peter tells them the whole story from beginning to end, and Luke writes it all. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying. Can you believe it? He goes through the whole thing, being careful to say, the Spirit told me. An angel came to Cornelius, and the Spirit said, don't hesitate. And when he came to the end of his story, he said this. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Luke writes it all out again for us to make a point. Not only is it true that the story of God's love is for everyone, but 
we must tell someone our God stories. Peter tells Cornelius and his soldiers, household friends, and Peter tells his friends the story of Cornelius. Are you telling your friends the story of God in your life? How God is changing you for the better, opening your eyes to the spiritual life around us, helping you love yourself and others more. We have more than one testimony. As God opens our eyes to fuller and fuller pictures of him, we will have many important moments with God. I wanna tell you just one of mine as an example. I was 25 years old and I was completely having a quarter life crisis. I had just quit my dream job because it turned out not to be a dream. And for me, in school, in college, in my early career, I worked really hard. I felt like my life was at stake if I didn't do a good job. I had needed to earn my worth. So I got good grades, I did the hard things, I got the internships that got me the job. But when I got the job that I thought I wanted, and then it turned out to be terrible, I just kind of lost who I was. I felt so invisible and so unimportant, even in the eyes of God, because I I did know God then. I'd invited Jesus into my life, but I don't know. I felt like I'd let God down somehow by not being able to make it and be impressive for God. I don't know. I thought I had to be a certain way in order to be good enough. And God showed up for me in a way that changed my faith and life forever. It's fundamental to why I believe in God still. It still speaks to the deepest wounds and fears in me. This is the God I believe in, the one who loves us. See, I was invited to a Crossing Women's event, and that morning we were told to take like a little piece of paper that had a verse on it and just walk around and read it three times. And this is the one I chose. It was this. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I read it three times, and on the third time, I couldn't even stay standing. I literally like crumpled to the grass and actually understood it for my life. I saw it clearly. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, okay? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's love and forgiveness and passion and involvement in my life, that's enough. God's power is made perfect, strong and good in my weakness. There's nothing for me to, earn. I don't have to perform. My life is not at stake. I'm free to live a life of love and rest. And yes, I will have purpose and a reason to do hard things, but not to earn my worth anymore. Because I love God and I am loved by God just as I am every single day. And that's part of why I believe in God. So what are your stories? How has God met you? Have you ever practiced writing down the times that God changed your life? First time, second time, third time. If Luke can go to the trouble of writing the story of Peter and Cornelius twice in full, surely we can write our stories once or twice to be ready to share them. There are two things for us to remember from Acts 10 and 11, this incredibly rich moment in the history of the church. The story of God's love is for everyone, and we must tell someone our God stories. Never let yourself get stuck thinking God doesn't want to reach everyone. And always remember that your stories with God, they matter. Make sure you start talking about how God is moving in your life. Remove the exclusivity. Include people in what God is doing because Jesus is for the whole world. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the power of how you have moved, that since the beginning, You've been trying to show us that you are for everyone, that you show no favoritism, that we are not left out of where the action is. We are included in the action, that you want us to be a part of it, and that you also want us to share our stories of what we've experienced with you to help other people know that you are real and active as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.